Are you ready for the word of the Lord today? Yeah. All righty. Let's go ahead and uh, we're going to have our prayer and, uh, and have our confession. And, uh, and then we're going to get into it. Father God, thank you so much for allowing us to be here. It's not by power, not by might, but it's by your grace. And so we thank you for that. If we are here, and we are, and we're still breathing, that means you are not done with our lives yet. And so, Father God, whatever it is you want to do in and through and with our lives, God, we're presenting our bodies to you as living sacrifices because we want to maximize our potential in you. And so I pray, oh God, with that being said, that you would allow revelation knowledge to flow freely in this place today, unhindered or uninterrupted by any satanic our demonic force. I'm asking, oh God, that you would touch our minds, that we today would have the mind of Christ, touch our ears, that we might be able to hear with our spirit. But most importantly, God, I pray that we would pause in a moment of reflection and examine our own hearts to make sure that there is nothing inside of us that would limit the power of your potential in our lives. You said in Ephesians, you said, I am able to do exceeding abundantly above all that they could ever ask or think but there is a limitation it's according to the power that's working on the inside of them and so father right now we repent just like David and we say Lord create within us a clean heart and renew a right spirit within us let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight O oh Lord our strength and our redeemer we thank you for it God we thank you for it now Lord I just prayed for those babies the same thing that you spoke over Jeremiah and the same thing that I declare over my own life every time I take this platform. You said before I knew you, Marvin, I had already formed you, called you, and given you an assignment. I pray, Father God, that what you saw me doing in eternity, what you purposed and planned that I should do in heaven, that it manifests itself here in the earth today. And in so doing, I simply ask that two things take place. Number one, that your people be blessed. Number two, that your name receive all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. We thank you and we believe that we've received everything we just asked for. In the wonderful, the marvelous, the matchless, the majestic name of Jesus the Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords. And all of God's people said amen and amen. Please take your Bibles or any uh, digital devices that you may have with you today. Uh, lift them up and repeat after me. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. And I can do exactly what it says I can do. I am a believer. I'm not a doubter. I am a doer and not just a hearer. This is the word of faith for my life. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And I shall be all the better after having heard God's word. Receive that one more time with a praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen and amen. Uh, we are going to continue with the message that I started last week. And for some reason, I felt rushed. And so I want to go ahead and do a review and, and really take my time into getting into part two of this message because this, the messages that you hear at the head of the year, at the beginning of the new year, should be the messages that stick with you and that you reference throughout the rest of the year to see whether or not you are on course spiritually. And it is so important to me as this is just the way I am as a pastor. My greatest joy comes seeing you experience your greatest success. My prayer for you is that at the end, be it the will of God that we live, is that at the end of 2024, you can look back over that year and say, look what the Lord has done. And so what I'm trying to share with you are principles that I believe will help you have a successful new year in 2024. How many of you want to do better in 2024 than you did in 2023? That, that should be, it should be a natural progression. If you are a logically thinking person, that I want to do better in 2024 than I did in 2023. I want my marriage to be at a different level. I want my finances to be at a different level. But most of all, I want my relationship with my Heavenly Father to be at a different level. And I believe if you'll follow these strategies, you see, 
you're waiting on God to do something for you, and God is waiting on you to do something for yourself. So stand to your feet. Let's go ahead and take a look at these two scriptures. And, uh, and then we're going, and I'm trying not to rush and talk fast. I want to take my time. And uh, you all ready? Yes, sir. All right, let's read. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. You all didn't, didn't read that to me like you read it with a sense of understanding or passion. I, I, let, let me give you some context about this scripture. This is written by a young man whose name is Joshua. Uh, he was a mentee of a man whose name was Moses. He was very familiar uh, with the temperaments of the people of Israel. He knew that they could be kind, but he also knew that they loved to throw rocks. And now Moses was dead, and he has this awesome, awesome, huge task that all of a sudden has been dumped on him. And God gives him directions, and he tells them, if you do this, don't be afraid. If you do this, you will succeed. These words are true not only for Joshua, but these words are true for you and I today. He said, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. One of the things you ought to do in 2024 is build a faith-filled confession. Stop letting the world speak over your life, speak over your own life according to the word of God because he said, my word will not return to me empty or void, but it would prosper in the thing whereunto it's sent. So meditate in the word. He says day and night. And then the most important thing he says, you are to do the word. He said, if you will do these two things, meditate, speak it and do it. He said, you won't have to worry about me making you successful you will make your own way successful in life. The next scripture before we go today uh, is Proverbs chapter 18 and 15, and we have that in the Message Bible. Wise men and women are always learning, always listening for fresh insights. All right, you all may be seated. Now, um, even though we can't be certain of our futures, we can be sure of God's desire for us in the future. And this is the thing that you have to understand about God. God is your heavenly father that desires that you experience good success. Let me say that again. God as your heavenly father wants you to experience good success. There is something wrong with a parent that does not want their child to go to heights and levels that they didn't reach. You always want your children to go higher, to go farther, to attain more, to accomplish more. If that's not how you're thinking, something's wrong with, with your thinking, you see. And uh, so that is the way that God feels about us to the extent, Jeremiah 29 and 11, quick review, come on, let's put it up. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, declares the Lord, plans. What are his plans? It is not the plan of God for you to go broke. If you went broke, it's because you made some jacked up financial decisions. And I have been there. I told y'all, I remember a time when if you added all three of my credit scores together, you might get around six or something like that, you know. But his plans are to prosper you and not to harm you. God is not some mean God trying to get back at you for something that you did five years ago. But his plans to give you a hope and to give you a future. Jesus said it this way, John 10, 10. When Jesus came, he said, I have come. I still don't think the church understands what he meant. When he said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Now he says the thief comes, but to kill, to steal, and to destroy. That's the devil's job. But God has another idea for you. He wants you to experience life and he wants you to experience on a more abundant level. This is what Christians don't understand. The same problems that unsaved people have, saved people encounter those same problems and challenges in life. The only thing different is we have a supernatural helper that lives on the inside whose name is the Holy Ghost. And because of that, we can be assured of victory. We never, listen, we never take an L. Christians never lose. We simply learn. In other words, what you went through last year, you should have learned something from that. You didn't lose. You simply gained another degree of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. One of the points I'm going to talk about today is don't get stuck on stupid. If you learned something last year and, and, and you realize, don't do the same thing again this year, okay? 
So God is committed to us having a different quality of life. He's committed to, to, he is committed to it to the degree. He said, I'll teach you and I'll show you how to become profitable in life. Yeah. Isaiah chapter 48 and verse number 17. It's a different sermon. Uh, y'all know y'all got people in, in, in mega churches that haven't read the Bible? that are just picking up sermon books and teaching sermons and, and, and reading psychology, uh, psychology books and, and, and whatnot and teaching and have never read the scriptures. And we're going to talk about that later on. But look at this. Thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord thy God, which does what? Which teaches you to profit. And then he said, I will lead you in the path that you should go. Now, here's one thing about 2024 you have to remember. God can't lead you where you don't want to go. No one, no one, can lead you where you want, where you don't want to go. God can't even make you go where you don't want to go. After everything that I'm about to share with you, in the, the final analysis will boil down to this. It's like medication. If you go to the doctor and the doctor writes you a prescription and he tells you to take all of this until all the medication is gone, what do we do? What do I do? Okay, let me, I don't know what y'all do. All right. Have you ever gotten a prescription and, and you took it until you felt better? And when you felt, that's why we have a lot of scripts in the thing right now, because we didn't do it according to instruction. We did it until we felt better, and then we stopped, okay? Now, if you get sick again, it's not the physician's problem. It's your problem because you didn't do what you were supposed to do. And so it's the same way. You know, it's like a pattern. How many of you sew? See, women don't do that too much, but I, I, again, I grew up in a different era era. Women sold. They went and they got patterns from McCall's and, and what's some of these other McCormick? What? They had patterns, right? Now, and I'm trying to tell you this is because if you'll follow these principles, you're going to get the desired outcome. When you get a pattern, there is a picture on the front of the pattern that shows you what the finished product should be. So you buy the pattern because you want the end result. You don't buy the pattern unless you want the end result. But when you open the actual pattern, a finished dress is not in the pattern. When you open the pattern, there's something like parchment paper. And there's several, some of y'all have never seen this. I saw this growing up because I, I lived in a house full of women. And so you, you have these pieces of parchment and you have to take the parchment you have to put it on a piece of cloth and cut it according to the guide. Now, all of those individual pieces left by themselves and just hanging on the table look like nothing. But when you take those pieces and you put them together according to the pattern, if you follow the pattern, at the end of the process, you should have something that at least resembles. <laughs> It should kind of look like <laughs> what was on the picture. In other words, the sleeve shouldn't be where the pant leg goes. The button shouldn't be where the zipper goes. And you see, this is the thing with Christians. You are trying to do life without... Christians are trying to do life without a spiritual pattern. And you're doing it the way you think that you want to do it. And now you've got some results that doesn't look like what the Bible says are the results that you're supposed to get. You see? But if we follow a strategic plan and we do it the way that God says do it, then God has to do his part and bless your life the way that he said that he would bless your life. So let's go ahead and get into these principles because I'm, I'm, I'm still in my review. All right. Number one, give God a place of preeminence. Okay. Let God be first. Okay. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. Acknowledge him in all thy ways and he shall direct his path. Don't just talk about making God first. Jesus said, if you love me, he said, keep my commandments. He also said this. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of, he of heaven and its righteousness and all of these things. Do you want to be prosperous? How many of you want to be prosperous? Seek God and stop seeking the bag. If you seek God, the bag will follow. He said, if you will obey me, he said, I will command my blessings upon you and my blessings will overtake you in the way. Amen. I want to talk about some things, but it's, it's hard for me to talk about things and, and how God has prospered my life without people taking it the wrong way. 
And so let me just go ahead on, because somebody else, I don't feel like dealing with the foolishness. All right. Uh, <laughs> but here's the thing. Regardless of what God wants for you, regardless of how many principles I put before you, in the end, it's going to be up to you. It's going to be a matter of choice. You will either choose to do this or you will choose to do that and you will get what you get. Let me share some of this old folks wisdom with you. If you make your bed hard. Y'all have heard that? If you make your bed hard, you're going to have to lie in it, you see. So let's go ahead. We said give God a place of preeminence in our life. And, uh, and let's make him first place. That means when I get ready to make a decision that involves myself, my family, my business, my career, my finances, God, what do you think about this? What does your word say about this? In all matters pertaining to faith and conduct as Christians, we should always defer to the word of God. Let me say that again in a way that you can understand it. But first, how I originally said it. In all matters pertaining to faith and conduct, we always defer to the Word of God. We don't defer to popular opinion. We don't defer to what feels right. We don't defer to, to, to what, um, what's culturally correct. We go to the Word of God, and what the Word of God says about it, that's what we're going to do. Can I share with you all something that's so simple and profound, and most people miss it as it relates to married couples? If every person that was married, if the men did what they were supposed to do, the husbands, the fathers, and if the women did what they were supposed to do, according to the Word of God, you wouldn't have any divorce. But we do what we want to do. And when you do what you want to do, you get what you get. Okay. So, number one, keep God in, in the, a place of priority in your life. Number two, close the door on last year's disappointments. I didn't show you this scripture, but we need to take a look at it. Let's get a look at Philippians um, chapter 3 and verse 13. Yeah, disappointment is a part of life, but don't let it linger. Close the door on last year's disappointments. Close the door on last year's failures. Close the door on the people that hurt you and the people that mess you up. And, and, and here's some advice I want to give you. Don't nurse it. Don't rehearse it. And don't try to reverse it. Let me say it again. It may have been distasteful, and it may have been a bad situation for you, but don't nurse it. What do I mean by nursing it? Have you ever at night just laid down to sleep, and you thought about something where you messed up, and you thought about how stupid you were? And you rolled it around in your head, and you tried to look at, look at it from all the different angles, and you tried to work, how could I have done that? How? Stop nursing it. Because when you nurse something, guess what? It grows. It gets bigger. The next thing is, stop rehearsing it. Stop calling up people and telling them how bad your life is. Stop calling people and just rehearsing the same pain over and over and over. Stop. And then again, don't try to reverse it. If I could do it all over again. No, you can't. It's been done now. You see, your view has to be this. Don't try to reverse it. But this is my view. All things work together for good. Yes, it hurt me. Yes, I cried. Yes, I was embarrassed. Yes, I, lost, I suffered some loss. But that's okay. At the end of the day, God somehow, I wouldn't serve God if he couldn't do this. God says, I'm going to turn your mess into a message. I'm going to turn your problem into a praise. I'm going to turn the test that you went through into a testimony. So don't try to reverse it. God knows exactly what he's doing. And at the end, you will appreciate it. See, some things... You can't appreciate until you've gotten to the other side. And when you get to the other side, you, you can look back and you go, that's what God was doing. I just couldn't see it at that time because I was too emotionally invested in what I was going through and I did not see the hand of God. How many of you have ever gone through something where you cried, you were embarrassed, you were ashamed, you suffered loss, but now when you look back on it in this season of your life, See, sometimes you ought to celebrate when some people leave your life. You ought to clap when they go. <laughs> Amen. All right. And let me tell you why you ought to clap before you go. That brings me to my third point. Um, what was the number three? This brings me to my fourth point. Yeah. All right. Choose your relationships wisely. <laughs> Choose your relationships wisely. I want, I want to pause right here for a minute and talk to you about this. Um, who you are associated with 
can cause doors either to open or close for you based upon the names of the people that you hang out with. They may not know anything about you, but they know the folk that you hang out with. Be careful about choosing right relationships. Uh, we have a musician that we lost. I, I don't mean like dead or nothing. He just moved. Uh, he, he and his wife, and, and they're up in, uh, in Delaware right now. And it just so happens that this musician who moved to Delaware ended up auditioning for a job at my pastor's church, First Baptist Church of Glen Arden. You're talking 30,000 plus members. And um, it, it's funny how God worked. No, I don't know if God worked out. But anyway, they had an opening for the musician. He was there. And, uh, and my pastor got on the phone, and he called me. He, he texted me. We started texting back and forth. And he asked me, he said, he said uh, who, who is this guy? You see? What I'm telling you is carry yourself so that whenever you leave or wherever you go, the folk that you left behind have no problem saying, hey, this is your guy right here. You know, and, and here's the thing about me. Um, it, it's not your talent, it's not your gift that impresses me. What impresses me is your heart and your spirit. You see, musicians come and go all the time. I don't care if you can, pr if you can play till everybody just falls out and faints. If you got a nasty attitude, a nasty heart, and a sinful life, you're not going to play here at the River of Life Christian Center because I'm not concerned about your gift. I'm concerned about your heart. You see? Amen. And so be careful about the, choose your relationships wisely. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 3, be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Have you ever thought about this? The greatest king in the history of Israel, in the biblical history of Israel, is a man whose name was David. Now, David was, it, it, it's funny, he was hit or miss. Either he was doing good or he was doing something crazy. He had a lot of problems in his life. He was a horrible parent. He had a dysfunctional family. Not only was he a horrible parent with a dysfunctional uh, family, he had flesh issues. If you read your Bible carefully, David wrote about one time his, 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 uh, his loins were on fire. <laughs> now, read your Bible. I'm not making this up. I don't know too many things that make your loins get on fire except for... Um, <laughs> But I want you to think about this. I, I guarantee you, when you get in trouble, what book do you go to? Psalms. Because it brings, now, now, why can we relate to the book of Psalms so well? Now, this because all of us have parts of David in our lives, whether you like it or not. But think about this great man of God who had ups and downs, hills and valleys. He had victories and he had defeats. When he sat down and he began to write the Psalms, the very first song that he wrote, had to do with choosing right relationships. Put some, it's not in my notes, put it up there. Blessed is the man. <laughs> what David said is this. David said, if you want to have a blessed life, be careful who you rock with. He said, blessed is the man that walketh not, can I get my scripture, in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth, in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree. But we don't want to go that far, but let's look at this. Okay. Back up. <laughs> okay. Do you see the progression? Walking. And if you keep walking with him, after a while you're going to stop, and you're going to start standing. And if you keep on hanging out, then you're going to just sit and get comfortable. Be careful who you, okay, let me, I, I want to frame this in a ni nice way because I'm not judging anybody's mess. I don't want to uh, uh, perpetuate or, or keep something going. But a couple of weeks ago, um, social media was a buzz about a, a prominent um, televangelist. Uh, you all would know his name if I called it. And uh, what the Lord asked me sometimes when situations occur, like, hey, Marvin, what did you learn? Be careful of the environments because if you don't go some places, People can't say you were there. One of the things about being a Christian that we, I don't think, we, we think about too much, you can't go everywhere. You can't hang out with everybody. You can't do what they're doing. And you have to get to a point in your spiritual walk with God where you no longer want to go. And you no longer want to do that. Can I tell you something? God will change your appetites and he will change your desires in life. 
So be careful about the people that you hang out with. And when God tells you that a relationship needs to be severed, you don't have to go to the person and tell them, I ain't going to hang out with you. I ain't, I ain't rocking with you no more. No, what you do is you just gradually, you make some slow steps back and, and, and just gradually move away because God knows exactly what he's doing. There are some things that God cannot do for you and through you until you shed some of the relationships that you have around you. The Bible says when Lot was separated from Abraham, then God called him and reaffirmed the covenant. You see, some people, he's not going to do it as long as they are there. And the sad part is, is sometimes you're sleeping with them. Let's go ahead. Something else. All right. Now. All right. Let's get into some of the, some of the new stuff. All right. Yeah, because my time is going. All right. Number five. Make a commitment to excellence. Let's take a look at, uh, at Daniel chapter 6. Now, now, this is something. If I'm, if, if I'm working on a project, I want to do that project so that when it's finished, I would be proud to sign my name to it and say, that's my work. If you are doing something, whether you're, on your work, whether you're at your workplace or whatever the king may be, and you are not doing things in a way that's pleasing God and you are not putting up your best effort, but yet you want the best pay, all right? You need to rethink that. Christians, if, if no one else has a spirit of excellence, Christians ought to have a spirit of excellence. That's why from the time of our inception up until this very moment, we've, we've never been a chicken grease church. Now, some of y'all don't, we didn't sell no fish sandwiches. We didn't sell no chicken sandwiches or all kinds of stuff like that. We decided we were going to try to do it God's way with simply tithes and offerings, and God has blessed us. When we do a program here at the church, we always try to do the best that we possibly can to the degree that after the program is done, we have out briefings where we bring the whole team together after we finish. We sit down with Chris and some other people and we look at the opportunities that we had, some areas that we could, we're always trying to go. See, Christians should always be trying to go to the next level. Isn't it sad that sometimes the worst employees on a place can be Christian employees? I'm serious. We, we, we used to have a guy uh, that went to church here. He owns a security firm. And he had several people under his employment. And he used to always complain and say the hardest thing to do is find good employees. And he hired some Christians. Some of them were from this church. And one night he got up early in the morning and, and left his job. And he went around riding to the different sites to see how his security people were working. And he came up on one site. And the guy was sitting in his security car. And he was knocked out. He was sleeping. You know. And so he, the guy didn't know that he owned the company. So he woke up and said, hey, he said, hey, man, what you doing? He said, man, he said, I'm out here on the security job. He said, but I'm just catching a few winks. He said, I got to go work my other job in the morning. So I'm trying to get some sleep on this job and, and go work my other job during the day. He said, is that right? He said, who you work for? He, got, he told him the name of the company. He said, I, I'm him. <laughs> he said, give me your stuff. Get out of the car and leave. I'll stay here for the rest of the night. And here's the thing. It was a Christian. You see? And so you never want to be in a situation, you know, you, you play in Kirk Franklin, you got a cross around your neck and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> but you're the first person that gets in trouble at work. As a matter of fact, work starts at 8. You roll in 8.30, 8.45. The day is over with at 4. 3.30, your stuff is packed, and you made your way to the break room because you're going you're gonna to slide right around there. <laughs> I ain't giving these people all of my effort. They don't pay me enough. <laughs> but do you know what the scripture says? The scripture says we are to work as unto the Lord. Okay. When, when you have a spirit of excellence, people will promote you. The people that, that we try to hire and the people that I try to keep around me are people that have demonstrated that they have a spirit of excellence. They're going to do it the best that they can do, you know. And, and, and I'm telling you, it is a blessing when you have people that are in your circle that believe in the power of excellence. But here's the thing. There's the power of excellence. There's the pursuit of excellence. Then there's something that's called the persecution of excellence. What is the persecution of excellence? Let's go back to the scenario I just gave you, okay. 
you've got this new job, right? It's paying you better than you've ever been paid before. The job starts at 8. You show up at 7.30 every morning. The job is over with at 4. You leave at 4.30 every day. The people that don't have a spirit of excellence, after a while, they're going to question you and persecute you because your excellence has now shined a light on their mediocrity. You see, until you came along, this was how we did it. But now here you coming in, coming in 30 minutes early. And then this is what they'll do. Hey, man, you know, you don't have to come in that early. And then when they leave, they, come on, man, we're going, we going to go by the bar. It's happy. Come on and go with us, you see. And then when you don't do that, when you decide, I'm going to do this because God gave me this job. I'm going to work as unto the Lord. Now they're trying to get you fired. They're trying to get you fired because your excellence shined a light on their mediocrity. And they want to get you out of the picture. Can I tell you something? It's the same way in church. It's the same way in church. If you go into a church, you know, and, and you're holding, you're full of fire, and everybody else, you know, is just kind of doing what they want to do, they're going to point the finger at you. And they're going to try to, because th- th- we don't do it that way. That's not how we do it. But in your mind, it's like, I'm doing this God's way. It's not about how your way or this way. I'm just trying to do God's will and do it God's way. Now, all of a sudden, they don't like you. They lying about you, talking about you. Every time you get put in a leadership position because you got that leadership position because excellence was all over you, favor was all over you, and now all of a sudden they try to tear down what you're doing. You see? And so there is a persecution of excellence. Boy, I want to bring this home so bad. I'm talking about my house. Y'all know you, you know, I, I ain't gonna say nothing wrong. You know, I, I love you. We all right? We all right? <laughs> How many of y'all, when, when most of y'all come home, you tired, just put stuff down? Take my coat off here, take my shoes off here, take all that stuff off here, and then you go upstairs and you do whatever you want to do, right? Now, I'm totally different. When I come home, I go ahead and I hang my stuff up because when I'm relaxing, I'm relaxing. I'm, I'm lounging with everything. So I went downstairs the other morning and I saw shoes here. A box here, a purse here, and gifts here. And so I didn't say nothing. I didn't say nothing. I picked everything up, and I put it in one spot so that this person who owned all of these things, when they came down, they could not help but see their lack of excellence. I didn't say, I just put it there. And when I saw him, you know, tipping up the stairs, putting this stuff away, I just smiled real quiet, you know, amen. But what I'm saying is, is see, sometimes what you have to do is you have to set a standard. Do you know that God has called you to be the standard bearer? You should be the hardest working, longest staying, highest paid person on your job because the favor of God is on you. Instead, you're the first one that got fired. And then you try to put God in it. Yeah, you know, they don't want nobody to witness on the job. I was just in the break room trying to tell them about the Lord. They didn't hire you to be an evangelist. They hired you to work, all right? You can evangelize after you get done. All right, now, make a commitment to excellence. Not, I mean, listen, this starts at the house. It's little stuff. Don't let your car get so dirty that people can walk up to your car in the parking lot and write on your car, wash me, please. Some of y'all right now, your car is so junky, you're not going to get nobody a ride. It's not because you don't want them. You're embarrassed by what's on the end. Your car looks like a homeless person slept in it. Don't just look straight ahead. Don't say nothing, all right? And nobody will know that I somehow picked you out of the crowd, all right? Have a spirit of excellence. When you go to bed at night, wash the dishes. Roaches just love your house. <laughs> Because they know they're going to get a feast when the light goes off. <laughs> All right. All right. Now, I'm sorry. I'm just, you know, that's just my nature. All right. Here's the next thing, number six, and we're going to get to number seven. Develop a mental paradigm of success. Do you know why God, God can't take you to a place until you can see yourself there? Please hear me what I'm saying. God cannot take you to a place until you see yourself there. 
And you have to remember that expansion, exposure brings expansion. I'm going to say it again. Exposure brings expansion. When I see it, if I never see it, I can't believe for it. But when I see it, I'm exposed to it, and now I can release my faith to expand to it, you see. And so you have to have a mental paradigm for success. I, I wish you all could understand how God made us. It, it, it is amazing how God has made us. All right, let me give you a good example. And you are, we have no idea what part our, our mind and our thinking plays in the whole process. Okay. How many of you have ever lost your keys? And when your keys were lost, what do you say? I lost my keys. I can't find my keys. As soon as those words let your mouth, left your mouth, believe it or not, your brain shut down as it relates to your keys. You can walk all around those keys and not see those keys. A person can walk in from the house while you're tearing up everything looking for your keys, and they'll say, Mama, your keys are right here. And you, you'll say this, if, if it was a snake, it would have bit me. It was right there. And why? Because you said, I have lost my keys. Okay? Have you ever noticed that when you go shopping for a new car and you test drive that new car, you don't have to buy it, but let's say you test drive it. When you leave the lot and you're driving home, you'll say, oh, that's the car just like the one we're going to get. And then you get to another, oh, there's another one just like the one we're going to get. You get enough, that babe, look, there's another one just like, guess what? Those cars were always there. But you didn't always see them or recognize them because your mind was not tuned. Jesus, if I could get you all to get the... Start putting a picture of what you want in your life on your refrigerator. Paint a picture on the canvas of your imagination and water it with confessions from the Word of God and commit that thing to God. And you can believe... Oh, Jesus. Deborah and I talk about this a lot. Um... My parents never left the United States. I think they went to New York once, uh, D.C. I can't remember a lot of trips that, that they've taken. You know, and they, were nothing, they weren't bad people. That was just them. Okay. Um, had I stayed in that same mindset. But I began to do things. I began, and I still do this. Deborah will tell you. I, I spend hours probably too much, sometimes on YouTube looking at places that I want to go. Then I look at people and how they got there. Then I try to find ways to curb the cost to get there. But now what I've done is I have an image in my mind. And, and you see, if I keep that image in my mind, after a while, I'll walk in what I thought about. Okay. The way that this thing goes is God wants you to... Okay, do you remember when David was getting ready to go and battle Goliath. An interesting conversation took place. Now remember, David's just a shepherd boy. But an interesting conversation takes place between David, who is just a lowly shepherd boy, and the king of all of Israel, whose name was Saul. And he goes then and he talks to the king before he goes to fight this monumental battle. This battle that they see no way in the world that he can win. They gave David about as much chance as a snowflake in Hades. I said that the nice way, didn't I? All right. and, uh, and he went and talked to the king. And you know what the king says? The king says, Sir David, he, he sized him up based on his physical size. See, it's not about the size of the dogs in the fight. It's about the size of the fight in the dog. And so he stood there. He said, David, he said, this is a fighting man from his youth. He was raised up to kill people and to take their heads. And you know what David said? David had a mental picture in his head. He said, when I was out there, in the field watching my father's sheep and whatnot. He said, a bear came along and, and took one of the little ewe, ewe lambs and, and I killed that bear. And he said, a lion came along and did the same thing. He said, I grabbed him by the beard and I killed him too. And he said, this guy, Goliath, that's out here selling all these wolf tickets, he's going to be just like the lion and just like the bear. David knew what he was going to do before his foot ever hit the battlefield. And Saul said, Saul said, well, let me help you out. Put on my coat of mail. Take my shield. Take my sword. Take my arrow. Take that. And, and the Bible says David tried it for a little while, but he was white. He couldn't get it right. See, you, you've, got to, you've got to learn how to throw the rock that's in your hand and quit trying to use somebody else's tool, you see. 
And so David said, I'm not comfortable with, and can you imagine, here this boy is, he walks out to this, this huge battlefield, and all he has is a slingshot and five smooth stones. Now, I've told you all this before, but it bears repeating. Why did David choose only, why not six, why not seven, why not one, why not two? The land of Philistia had five provinces, Ekron, Ashdod, Gath, Ascalon. I can't think of the other one. But each province had a giant. And, Dave, and, and Goliath was the champion of one of those products. So in David's mind, Jesus, even before he gets to the battlefield, he says, okay, I don't need six rocks. I got one for Goliath. And if the other one gets froggy and he jumps up, I've got one for him. And if he goes over and he grabs his other big brother over in the other camp, I got one for him. I'm not going to miss not one single time. I'm going to find my target every... That's the mental attitude that you have to have. I'm going to tell y'all something. All right, I'm, I'm getting ready to close. I got one more point. Um, June, I stopped doing all physical activities. I stopped playing golf and, and all kinds of stuff like that until January. I'm getting back on the horse because uh, I'm going to win this weight loss challenge. Y'all ain't going to beat me. <laughs> I'm telling you right now, we're going to be cruising. I'm going to send y'all some videos. See, I told y'all. <laughs> All right. But um, when I was golfing, I don't, I don't know if Dan, Danny told me he's going to play at another church. Ron may be here. But they will tell you, I talk more trash. I talk trash before we play. I talk trash while we're playing. And if I lose, I still talk trash. I just talk trash because I believe I'm the baddest uh, guy that's out there. <laughs> Now, my performance may not show it that day, but in my heart, before I hit the ball first, I'm bad. I, don't even look at me when I swing my club. Hold your head down. Don't you know who's on the tee box? Sometimes my mentality is so jacked up, this is what I'll do on first tee. I'll say this. Approaching the tee box, the very first tee box, all the way from Greenville, Florida, number one golfer in the world, Pastor Marvin A. Jackson. I'll give my own self some applause. All right, let me get to my last point. But what I'm saying is, stop seeing yourself as defeated. How come you can't see yourself as a champion? Stop seeing yourself as an employee and see yourself as the owner. Stop, see, stop letting the culture put you in a little box and label and define who you are. They will put me in a box when I'm dead. I refuse to let you put me in a box while I'm alive. People see me doing all kinds of stuff and they figure, well, well, a pastor shouldn't be doing, I like videography, I like to do creative things, you know, I like to do all these kind of different things. I'm not that sober pastor just sits around and doesn't do nothing, doesn't have any fun. I'm just a sad you see. I'm sad you see all the time. No. I'm going to enjoy my life and I'm going to enjoy Jesus too. All right. <laughs> Last one before we go. Develop a paradigm of success, mental paradigm of success. Last one. For every milestone, stop, pause, and give God glory. Now, what is a milestone to you and what's a milestone to me? They mean, I do some little things that, that you all probably you think it's no account. Deborah, Deborah knows about them. If I drive my car and we, let's say we, we decide we're going to go for a drive. Sometimes we just go and ride around the city just to get out of the house. When I pull in the garage... And I turn off my car. You're going to hear me say these words. Lord, thank you for watching over me while I was on the road. Because I realized that a whole lot of things could have happened to me while I was driving. And it was nothing but the goodness of God that brought me home. You don't always have to be speeding for something tragic to happen on the road. I was watching a video the other day. And a motorcycle was just sitting at the intersection. Red light. He was just sitting there. And an accident occurred over in the other lane facing him, hit a car, the car went airborne while he was just sitting there. Guess where the car went? Killed him on the spot. So I don't take that as a small thing when I get home. I say, Lord, thank you for keeping me. Now, something else that I do every single Sunday that the Lord sends. When I go home and I get upstairs today and I'm taking off my clothes, I'm going to say this prayer to God. I'm going to say, God, thank you for allowing me the honor of teaching your people today. Because I didn't have to be here. Somebody else could have been here. It is an honor to be able to stand here and to declare 
the wonderful works of God. And so when I get home, God, thank you, because I know that as soon as I leave, God can replace me with another that does it bigger, does it better, and does it better. So God, thank you for allowing this little boy from Greenville, Florida, to stand before your people, not only here. Do y'all know I'm beginning to realize I'm reaching folk, all, I'm getting emails from all across the country. People talking about how, because the internet or via television. So that is an honor. That is a privilege. And so what I'm saying is for every little accomplishment that you realize that had it not been for God, I would not have achieved this. God, I want to say thank you. <laughs> when, listen, when you get that letter that says all of your student debt has been forgiven, you better throw up both your hands and say, God, I thank you. When you realize that God has healed something in a relationship or in your family, God, I thank you. Whenever you reach a milestone with God, pause. I don't care who's around you. Just say, God, I thank you. Pastor Deborah, she has it bad because she'll say it for a parking spot. <laughs> Y'all never be thanking God for the parking spots? Here you are in the handicapped spot. God, I thank you. No, no. No, she doesn't do that, but what I'm saying is, you know, during the holidays when you're driving all around and you're frustrated, you got to get back to the house, and you had to go to the store because you need to get some lemon extract because they didn't have any at the house, and you're just driving all around, and everybody's out there acting crazy, and all of a sudden, right beside the handicapped spot, you see somebody pulling out, and they're pulling out right while your car is there. You have a little praise, but God, I thank you because you know I didn't want to walk. Truth of the matter is you should have parked a mile away because you need to walk anyway. But anyway, give, <laughs> give God glory and thank him for the word today. Hallelujah. Did you get anything out of the word of God today? Um, this is not in my notes, but I want to leave you with this also. Um, treat people the way you want to be treated. That's not in my notes. I just thought about it for some reason. Treat people. Talk to people the way that you want people to talk to you. Have you ever wondered what the world would be like if we treated people the way we wanted other people to treat us? The scriptural way of saying that is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Father God, we thank you for the word that we have heard today. God, we may have to wonder about some things, but one thing we don't have to wonder about, and that is your desire that we do well in life. Jesus was so committed to us doing well in life that he laid down his life so that we could experience another quality of life in the earth. And so, Father, I pray that you would hide the words that we've heard in this series in our hearts so that we might not sin against you. And then, God, give us the faith to see beyond our circumstance. Because sometimes it's not going to look like we're going to a next level, but that doesn't mean you're not taking us to a next level. And so, God, give us the faith so that we keep our eyes fixed on you and not on the circumstance or the situation or the people that are around us. Because you said that you know the thoughts concerning us. They're thoughts of peace and not of evil. Thoughts to prosper us and to bring us to an expected end. God, make 2024 a year of testimony, a year filled with countless hallelujahs, a year filled with praise. Because when we look back on it, we want to say, look what the Lord has done. We thank you. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. The saints that are in the building are praying. This is the most important moment of our worship service here at the River of Life Christian Center because this is the moment when we hope and we aspire to call people out of darkness and into the Lord's marvelous light. Imagine, if you will, a soul precariously hanging by a spider's web between hell and heaven. And what determines where that person ends up is not God, but that person's decision. God will send no one to hell. If you end up in hell when you leave this earth, it's because you chose to go there. If you simply stop focusing on yourself and your mistakes and how bad you are and how you've messed up, but just come to Jesus just like you are with all of your garbage, with all of your lies, with every, come to him with just like you are and say, Lord, I am coming to you because I need a savior. 
The Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will not be ashamed. They shall be saved. And so we want to give you that opportunity right now. Well, Pastor, what do I have to believe? What must I believe before I ask him that? You have to believe, first of all, that you are deserving of a just judgment, which would be eternal separation from God. But God sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh who bore all of your sins, every sin you've ever committed, the sins you're committing right now, the ones you will ever commit. He has already judged them in the person of Jesus Christ. And what God is saying is believe the testimony of my son. Believe that I made him who knew no sin to be sin for you, that you might be the righteousness. Believe that I took all of your sins and I placed it on him and he took your place. And if you'll just say, Lord, I believe that and I want to be saved, he will save you. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, saints of God are praying. If that is a decision that you want to make today, would you please put your hand high up in the air so that one of the ushers can see it because I won't be able to see it from up here. Um, but put your hands high in the air. I want to pray with you before you go home. Now somebody's saying, well, you know, um, I'm going to wait because I, I, I need to clean up the... I hear a conversation about somebody that has a mistress or a girlfriend. And you're not going to come today, but what you're saying is I want to end this first. And you've been trying to end it for months and it still hasn't ended. Who told you that you're going to get another opportunity? The Bible says, in the day that you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Another scripture in the Old Testament says this, call upon him while he is near. That lets me know if I have to call upon him, there could be a time when he's not so near. So don't assume that you'll be back in a church or don't assume that you'll have another opportunity. You can be leaving the church, pulling out of the parking lot and somebody can be barreling down OBT and you say your last farewell right outside this church. So don't take chances with this. So I'll ask you again, if you are in this place and you want to make that decision now, please raise your hand. Let me see it. Let's pray with you before you go home. Hallelujah. I do not see any hands that are raised. I'm not getting any signals from the ushers. So let's thank God that we have a house full of saved folk. Go ahead and give him praise. Where? Oh, God bless you. <laughs> what's up, what's up? Fist bump. What's your name? Uh, Jazz. Just call me Jazz. I can just call you Jazz. All right, so you ready to give your life to the Lord? Jazz, look at me. Don't back up. Right. Here's the thing. A lot of times, see, you made that decision here. There are some people that you know that are not here and that are not witnessing your decision that you made today. They're expecting you to return to them the same way that you left them. But now you have a challenge because you're going to return to them as a new creature. The Bible says, behold, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. And so a lot of times, the pressure of going back to an old environment or old relationships with a changed heart is they, accept, they expect you to be something that you're not anymore. Don't look back. Don't feel embarrassed. Don't feel bad about it. Stay focused on the Lord and everything's going to be all right. Promise? Okay, uh, there's a young lady over there, Thelma. She's going to take you to a private area. Give the Lord some praise. Hallelujah. The only other thing that can happen today that would make my day great is if the Dallas Cowboys lose. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. <laughs> Did y'all get anything out of the Word of God today? Put those seven principles. Listen. Put those seven principles in a place where every now and then you can go back and you can look at them. All of our messages here at the River of Life Christian Center are free. You can always get them on the YouTube channel. You can go back and you can listen to them and you can rehearse them. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule and sharing it with us today. We believe that this was a divine appointment. And until we see you again, now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before his presence with exceeding joy. To you, O oh God, we give the glory, the honor, and the praise. And our continual prayer for you and for your life and for your family is that may God's richest and best be yours. God bless you all. Happy Sunday.